We are a family? Yes. We should act like a family, right? Yes. And family usually gets closer together, don't they? Not always. Not always. <laughs> but as a family of God, we should get a little closer together. So I'm going to ask, I'm not going to command you to, but I'm not going to ask if you like. Just let's come a little closer. I'm going to be a little closer to you. You know, Wednesday night's a little different than Sunday. Sunday's more of a crowd. And um, when Jesus taught the crowds, he went up on the mount because everybody had a C, but we have a smaller group on Wednesday nights, so we can be closer to each other. And um, I think it's a good thing to be close sometimes. When Jesus taught, as any other rabbi, also when he taught, it was very interactive. People engaged him. They asked questions. Often his parables, he taught his parables in response to somebody's question. So we can't do this on Sundays, the way things are. We do our Q&A, but to get actually interaction would be very difficult because of the amount of people that are here. But on a Wednesday night, we can treat this a little bit more like a Bible study and be a little closer and a little more connected and interact and I've been asked that we'd have some testimony sometimes on Wednesday nights. But we could have that. We're going to do it a little different too when regarding the testimonies. We kind of did this on Thanksgiving Eve in the Family Life Center as I shared. And as things came to mind that went along, I'm just basically expanding on different, expanding on the Psalms. As things come to mind of a personal testimony that goes along with it, just share it. Is that cool? So the testimony kind of goes, flows along with the teaching. So that's what we're going to do a little different. And since we all have gifts, feel free to use your gifts too. God has something bubbling over inside of you. You have a word of knowledge, word of wisdom, you know, whatever it may be, let's use it. Let's participate. Let's be active because we're all part of the family. We're all part of a body and we all have a part to play. And you can be active even if you're sitting, right? Amen. So that's what we're going to do. So we're going, continuing, what's the series called? Knowing the Heart of God from the book of Psalms. And that's God's ultimate desire that we would know his heart. Because there's nothing worse than any of us have experienced that when somebody doesn't know our heart, doesn't understand our motive and has a wrong, wrong idea of who we really are. You know, I find, I was at a meeting yesterday with a bunch of leaders, and I've known them from a distance, but there's something when, when, a, when prayer really takes place and you hear people pray, you really get to know people's hearts. When they pray from their heart, <laughs> you get to know their heart, and like, wow, you think different of people. So it's good to get closer and Get to know each other. So we're going to be going from Psalms 61 to 70 tonight. So I'll take a scripture, usually out of the psalm, and then I'll expand on it. And again, if you have any testimony that goes along with that, just raise your hand. I'll bring you a mic and just share a little bit. All right? So Psalms 61, and this goes along with what Pastor Steve was saying in the, song, in the last song that he was singing. There's going to be a couple Psalms that go along with the rock. Amen. So the scripture, Psalm 61, verse 2 says, When my heart is overwhelmed, anybody at that place? When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Amen. Is there a song that goes along with that? Yeah. I think there is. So, what throughout the psalm, what God was speaking to me is in the sanctuary of the Lord, we find safety and shelter. But what God was also speaking to me is that as we find, as we grow in our relationship with God and he becomes our sanctuary, he becomes that safe place, that shelter, he, became, he becomes our refuge. We now, in Christ, become that sanctuary for others. People, you know, people need a tangible expression of God. 
It's good to know God is my shelter, but often we need to feel that, right? That's why we're part of a body. That's why God tangibly works through his body. So as we come into God's presence and he becomes our sanctuary, now we become the sanctuary of the Lord. And now the people that are out and about around us that are in need of shelter, that are in need of safety, that are in need of help, we now can provide that in Christ. Amen? And there's a lot of people in need out there, a lot of people that are not, their feet are not on the rock. Amen. Like Pastor Steve said, if his wife had stepped into that mud and he was on the rock and she was sinking down, the hand pull her right to the rock. And that's what, we're God's hand to pull people off that sand and into that secure rock. Amen? Amen. So that's Psalm 61. All right, I'm always going to be looking to see if anybody has something to add to it. And when you have something to add to it, though, just make it quick and to the point. Not too long because we want to respect other people and have the opportunity for others to share as well. Psalms 62. And the verse I grabbed out of that one was, He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Hallelujah. It's such a great thing not to be shaken anymore. Often our days were, remember our life when it was up and down, in and out, a new challenge after another challenge. And it's not like anything has changed, is that these things just don't shake us like they used to, right? We don't get knocked down like we used to. We don't lose it like we used to. Okay, maybe you did. <laughs> but let's declare it right now. I'm not going to be shaken no more in Christ, amen? amen? So the test of time reveals the divine. What am I saying there? Well, this is actually going along with what Pastor Steve was which was, was singing and what Lee um, brought forth out of that. When, you know, sand, what happens with sand? If you build a house on sand and the waves keep coming, you know, or if you're kind of close to the, sh the shore over time, it deteriorates, right? And eventually your house might get in the ocean. It's different when your house is planted upon the rock. With time, you know, if you're not planted upon the rock, things begin to evaporate, deteriorate, fall apart, crumble. And so we want to, God desires that everything in our life is planted in him. He wants us to put our trust in every area, no area in our life that the enemy has a foothold in. Nowhere in our life can he take away. So some of us, we might be strong in, um, we might be strong with, um, you know, with our, with our heart of service. We serve with all of our heart. We do everything unto the Lord. We're great on our job. But we're not trust, we don't trust God with our money. So in that area, you know, maybe we, um, when we have a bad day, we go shopping to feel better. So God isn't who we trust in. We need that to help us through. And therefore, there's an area in our life that the enemy can, you know, because we all know if we're in major debt, it's very hard to walk in peace, right? Right? It's very hard to focus on, God, what's your plan and will for me? Because all I'm thinking about is how am I going to pay off my bills? So we have to think, is there any area, is there sand in our life? Do we have sand around us? Is there certain things that we have put on sand? God wants to be the rock in everything. So those who know God personally wait patiently and quietly, for he is their rock and their fortress. They cannot be shaken. See, the test of time. That's how we know where we're at. How do we respond to certain things? I was just talking to Elvis today. So Elvis is being tested with time. He expected things to be a certain place, yet they're not. This is the test. 
this shows where you're at. If you're not shaken, you're really trusting God. If you're shaken, your trust is not where it needs to be. You need to go deeper in your relationship with God. So that's, that's it. You know, if we're shaken, we, we just know you to know, God, I need to go deeper. Some areas in my life, and there's, if there's something in the way, we gotta go back. Often I know, you know, as I meet with people and people go through inner healing and different things, they find out something that happened in their childhood that has kept them struggling in certain areas all the way into their older days. So we got to find out, God, what is it in me that's allowing me to continue to be shaken? Because in Christ, if I'm really on the rock, I shouldn't be shaken anymore. If somebody irritates me so easily all the time, what's wrong with me, Lord? It's not about them, it's about me. Why am I getting irritated? Because if I, had, if I was full of your love, love is not irritable. So therefore, why do I get irritated? So what is wrong with me, God? We too often point fingers at everybody else and not search my heart, oh God, and find what's in me that's causing me to, to stumble, causing me to be shaken. So we want to get to a place with that no matter how the situation looks, we understand that our victory has already been established. I'm not shaken because no matter how bad the storm may seem, I have the victory. I will see this storm out. God will see me through it. God is the Lord of the storm. He just has to speak peace and the storm is gone. So why do we get so discouraged then? Amen. Okay, we got one. All right. Um, just made me think of, oh. Yeah, not really. Oh, There's some sorry. people back there. Uh, the, the concept of being shaken it just made me think of what I've heard over the last couple of years, that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Has anybody heard that? Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is a fine tuning of on every level. It's the personal level and also on the world level. Uh, when you think of things being shaken, it could be anything from an earthquake shaking up your country or your state, uh, to your politics, to your government, to your banks, to, as you said, your own ability or desire to manage your own personal life. Mm -hmm. And that's how the Lord really gets to the depth of where we are by shaking us up. Yeah, good, good, good. Thanks for that. The mic might have an issue. You might have to just come up here and share, share what you have from this, because down out there, I think that's why it was given feedback. Awesome, awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Anyone else? Okay, we're going to Psalm 63. Verse one it says, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So those who earnestly search for God are those who are desperate for him. That's the best place we can be is desperate for God. Whatever's taken us, and usually it means a lot of pain, and heartache in life, but whatever it is that's taken us to that place of desperation, we can now thank God for it. Because there's many people that just kind of go through life, go to church, go through the motions, have a surface relationship with God, are good religious people, but they don't earnestly seek after God. And it's only those who really earnestly seek after God that truly discover him. If you seek me, you will find me. Amen. Seeking isn't just going to church. That's a heart thing. It's a heart-to-heart -heart connection thing. Church cannot do that. It's a personal relationship. So those who earnestly search for God are those who are desperate for him, who understand how limited they are without him. It's no, no better place to be than be broken and to be humble. So I thank God for the humility, basically the humiliation it's taken to have humility. So usually to gain humility only comes from humiliation. 
And so humiliation can be turned for good when it becomes humility. Amen? Their pursuit for him goes way beyond surface level Christianity. They desire to go to the deepest places. They are willing to surrender anything so that they may encounter more of his power and glory. They realize that the most satisfying treasure one can have is the unfailing love of God. And the more they discover, the more they pursue. Amen? Does that make you just want to worship the Lord? This is a worship psalm right there. That will take you deep. So as we go back to worship, keep in mind that song. When we go back, we're worshiping right here, right now. We don't have to wait till we sing. But that's part of it where we can just totally focus and go in. Psalm 64, I got so much out of this psalm, I couldn't even add a scripture. But the whole psalm, basically what it was sharing with me is, I find that people love to find something to complain about. It's like they don't have much to say unless it's negative. Why is this? Is it that they feel better about their own situations if they find other situations worse than theirs? Is it that they look for other people to blame for their woes rather than themselves? Is that a couple of the reasons why? God would rather, when it comes to us, his people, instead of being like the world, always talking about negative things, if we have something negative to say, he'd rather us complain to him than to one another. Than to tear down other people. Yes, he has called us, as the word says, to have praise continually come forth from our lips. But if we're upset about something and we can't keep it within us, if we can't let go of it to God, he would rather us talk to him about it. So he can straighten us out. You see, the majority of the Psalms was David talking to God with what he, the problems he was facing, all the, the, the heartache and pain of rejection and all the kind of things he was, you know, the enemies after him, his sons turning against him, all these things that he had to face, he would turn to God usually in the beginning of the psalm with disgust, upset, angry, basically just letting it all out to God and then God would reveal himself to him and it would turn around into praise. We can be honest with God because he knows our thoughts anyway. So if we're angry with God, tell him. He can handle it. He will straighten us out. Yes, he will. He even straightened out Job. He, told, he showed Job how big and great he is. <laughs> and that kind of silenced all the thoughts that were in Job's head. He didn't ever curse God. He never spoke against God. But, you know, it was hard for him to face what he was experiencing. Hard for him to figure it out. God revealed himself, and that spoke in of itself. Yes. We'll praise him. Amen. Yeah, he will not curse him. Nope. Yep. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. That's when we know it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Okay, hit it. That's 
Amen. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Okay. I know you. Robert knows the word. He can spit it out one after another. <laughs> yeah. The bad times usually prepare the heart. And that's what takes us to the good times because our heart is right. But come, how about it's easier to use the mic. So come, Tracy, and use the mic. I know, but the mic gets feedback. You don't want to get nervous about this, so stay right there. <laughs> um, I just want to talk about complaining because this really aggravates me and angers me because we should be grateful um, going through homelessness by choice to experience what they felt, to know what they go through. We got to remember that we got homes, we got families, we got food on our table. We got love, we got warmth, we got so much. And we forget to thank God, like, I was rushing through dinner, I'm learning, I'm a baby in Christ, y'all, so I'm learning the best I can on how to be more Christ-like. And I realized, up until I got baptized, I never blessed my food, I never said grace, I never understood all that. Going, taking those steps to go front line with the homeless, to know what they feel because I always advocated over the computer and almost died through the process. You got to be grateful. You got to stop complaining because every day you got to look around you just to, just to have a church to go to, just to have more of the blanket. Like you don't understand we're truly blessed even without riches. No, I'm not out there buying lottery tickets because that money, all I pray is it goes in the right hand. I'm not of the world no more, and you shouldn't have to go the level I did to know. Just look around you at each other, because they're alone out there, and they don't have nothing but, but the grace of God that gets you home. Amen. 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 Thank you, Tracy. Thank you. That's why throughout, throughout Psalms it says what? Praise the Lord at all times. Let praise continually be upon my lips. So the moment we start thinking negative stuff and just turn it around as quick as possible. Start thinking about all the good things. There's so much to be grateful for. So God would rather we complain to him than to tear down others. Okay, I said that. He'd rather we talk to him about it so he can straight, straighten us out. The question we've got to ask ourselves, do we want to be a weapon of the enemy to bring death and destruction or a weapon of God to establish justice and peace? What does the Bible say about the power of the tongue? Death and life is in the power of the tongue. So what, who, what side are we on is heard in our mouth. So we're, we can go to church all we want, but if we're tearing down others, we're still on the enemy side. So we can be here sitting next to one another, but if we're speaking evil all the time, we're really on the enemy side. So one may be a Christian, but if their words line up with the plans of the enemy, they have now become an enemy of God, and God will strike down those who oppose him. Again, God strikes us down. If we're his, he only strikes us down to raise us back up. We learn. You know, we learn from our misfortune. Psalm 65. In Psalm 65, 11, it says, Crown the year with bountiful harvest. Even the hard pathways overflow with abundance. See, most people, as we got, just went through Christmas, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, and all that, people so much look forward to the holidays. A lot of people of the world look forward to the holidays. It's a cheerful time. It's time to be around family. It's a, it's a, it's a good time. But we as Christians, we should be loving life every single day. Shouldn't just be, I can't wait for the, the you know, there's, just a, there's just something about the spirit of, of Christmas time. Well, we don't have a spirit of Christmas. There's just the Holy Spirit. There's many spirits in the world, but we only have one spirit as Christians. Now that's the Holy Spirit. Every other spirit we need to reject. So because we have the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's character is joy, therefore joy should be part of our everyday life. Shouldn't just because it's our birthday, or it's because it's Christmas, or it's because it's Easter, or it's because of some other festival. It's because Holy Spirit is in us, and God 
character is joy. So because of the joy that comes knowing, again, if we're having a lot of bad things going on in our life, things are not going the way we expected them to, just take a moment and say, oh yeah, my sins have been forgiven. Amen. Is that quite a bit enough to praise God? Amen. We have eternity. That, you know, there's a many things we could thank God for, but that's like the biggest thing. Jesus died for us. We are forgiven. Therefore, because of that, the walls of separation have been ripped down. We have a relationship with our creator, our maker. So we can now live as God's holy temple. You know, in, in heaven, it's a nonstop party. It's a nonstop celebration. The angels and, and the elders and all are singing holy, holy, holy to Lord God Almighty nonstop, continually, forevermore. It's just a party, celebration. There's nothing negative. There's no more death. There's no more sickness. There's no more any of these things. And yet, we are God's holy temple here on earth. So therefore, we are, like I preach on Sunday, heaven on earth. So let those festivities in heaven continue here on earth through us so we can bring that party atmosphere of heaven all the glory all the celebration of all the goodness of God here on earth through us his people for daily we have so much to celebrate for God hears and he answers our prayers no matter what we're facing we have hope hallelujah so as it said, even in the hard pathways, even in hard times, we can overflow with the abundance of joy because of the goodness of God. Praise the Lord. How many, who here at one time really suffered with depression or really was oppressed a lot and then suddenly God has done such a work and it's like joy is who you are now. You're a joyful person. Isn't that... That, just, that has to amaze the people that used to know you when you were a negative, depressed person. To now see you with joy, they probably, those are the kind that usually ask you, what are you on? What are you taking? Can I have some of that? So yeah, you can. Just lift up your hands and in the name of Jesus, receive it. The baptism of the Holy Spirit and you got it. So praise the Lord. Yet, yeah, come up and... All right. Short and sweet, though. Short and sweet. To the point. Amen. Amen. Restore. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Yep. Yep. I don't think any of us have killed anybody like that or. <laughs> mm hmm. Amen. That's right. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Robert. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Psalm 66, verses 16 and 17 says, Come and listen, all who fear God, and I will tell you what he did for me. For I cried out to him for help, praising him as I spoke. If we really love someone, we can't keep it within us. Though it may be politically incorrect to express our love for God in the public arena, we do it anyway. Because we can't hold it back. Our heart overflows with the joy of the Lord, for our lives are in his hands. He keeps our feet from stumbling. 
He has done such wonderful things. If we really believe Jesus is Lord and we have personally experienced his unconditional love and transforming power, we cannot help but sing praises unto him at all times and all places. I've probably given this example many, many times, but I will do it again. When I fell in love with my wife, and I'm continuing still in love with my wife, I cannot help but tell everybody about her. And I had every, so when I worked outside, when I, I was a waiter at that time, I had to tell everybody about my love for her because I couldn't hold it back. Even though that's not a place to really talk about that, people just are there to get their food and me to serve them. I couldn't help it because it was an overflow of my heart. I couldn't keep the mouth shut. So where are we with our love for God? You know, where you're not supposed to say that. I can't help it. Sorry. It's my heart is filled with the love of God. I have to share his love to everyone I meet. That should be our attitude. And if we're not there yet, God, fill me more with your love. Every day when we wake up, first thing, God, fill me with your love. Fill me with your love. And then when we go out about our day, it's just what's going to overflow out of us. Oh, man, I don't even know how to share, you know, to Jesus to people. I don't know how to witness. I don't know how to evangelize. Just get filled with his love. Right. It's out of that. It just flows out. It's not a work. It's just part of a relationship. And if you love somebody, you tell people about him. Amen. So that's evangelism 101. Just learned it. Just get filled with God's love and go out. And it'll just come out of you. Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us and his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. People generally desire to make the best of the land that they live on. And hope nothing but the best for the family they inherited. The nations of the world are the Lord's and all the people within them. So just like we care about our house, most of us, you know, especially, you know, in the neighborhood I now live in, people are very intense about their property. It's like they work all, every extra hour that they're not on their job, they're putting every little plant, making it all nice and neat. And, it's, and then if your yard is not as neat as the other guy's yard, they look down upon you. You know, it's that kind of neighborhood where it's all about who has the best yard. You know, who makes their house. Some people put up, as soon as one holiday's done, they have the decorations for the next holiday, even though it might be a couple months away. They're already putting it up. It's all looking all nice. It's like, because it's more of a show-off. So people put so much effort into what they own. So imagine God who owns the entire earth and all the heavens. See, the nations of the world are the Lord's and all the people within them. His heart is to show mercy by blessing and giving favor to all its inhabitants. He desires the nations to know his ways and his saving power. He desires to govern the world, establishing justice and righteous guidance. He wants, you know, like people would, would take such care to their yard and to everything because it reflects them. You know, and every person's yard is kind of different usually. It kind of reflects the difference of that individual. You know, if I did my yard the way I like it, it would be all Caribbean stuff and all that because that's who I am. I love Caribbean plants and figurines and all that kind of stuff. So I would do it totally different. If you look outside of our church, you're going to see the reflection of Roger. <laughs> all the little things that he has, the angels over here and this and that, these are what Roger's all about because he's the one that puts all that stuff out there. God wants his earth to reflect him. That's why I said, heaven on earth. So as the body of Christ, our inheritance is the nations of the world. So no longer we're so into our piece of land, our piece of property, but in Christ Jesus, our inheritance is the entire world. So, the mission, our mission is now the Great Commission to disciple the nations of the world. So let us not be small-minded and only think about our own little nation, our, only, our own little house, our own little property. God's heart is the whole thing. 
And we should have a heart for the entire world. We should care about what's going on in the Middle East. We should be praying. I was at a gathering yesterday and the last portion of the pray prayers were praying for, for um, Iraq and Sudan and what's going on because probably if, the, if, you, if you put yourself, you are one of those people in Iraq right now in a village and ISIS is surrounding you. And if you knew the type of praying that was going on in America, do you think you would be grateful? I hope so. I'm hoping that people are on their knees crying out for our brothers and sisters in the nations. But often we can get very caught up in our American lifestyle and our busyness of our own life that those things are not that much of a concern for us. We watch it on the news, we hear what's going on, and we don't even pray about it. So God, give us your heart. What is your heart for the nations? You care about everybody everywhere. People regarding missions, they say, oh, I don't, you know, okay, that's what's going on in Africa, that's what's going on over there, but what about our own nation? No, God's heart is for the nations. He's for this nation, and he's for all nations. So let us not have that kind of nationalistic pride. When we got saved, we became part of the kingdom of God. I'm no longer just an American. I'm a citizen of the kingdom. That's much higher than the American citizenship that I have. I'm glad that I'm an American citizen. I honor the nation I live in, but I'm of a higher citizenship, and that's the kingdom, and I care about the entire world now. Amen? So let's not be small-minded. So this is from Psalm 68, 5 through 6. And it says, A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, God sets the lonely in families. To be impoverished is to be in a, sit, is to be in a situation where your basic needs are not being met. Thank God we have come out of poverty, for he is now our way maker. Let me say that again. To be impoverished is to be in a situation where your basic needs are not being met. Thank God we have come out of poverty, for he is now our way maker. God is the father of the fatherless, the defender of widows. He places the lonely into families. To the prisoner they are set free. To those depressed they receive joy. To the sick he heals. Thank God we're no longer his enemies in rebellion where life just goes from one bad situation to the next without any hope for the better. So let's praise the Lord our Savior who has rescued us from death and now carries us in his arms. You know, those who are doing wickedness in this world, such as those who are in ISIS and different groups such as that, often these are people who are just surviving. They don't even know any better. They don't even have any hope. They don't know Christ. They've grown up in poverty. They've grown up in the worst of situations. They've seen and experienced the worst of things, so their heart has become hardened. So we've got to put ourselves in people's situations to have compassion, to show mercy, to pray, to have, to have God's heart. And we've got to thank God that we could easily been, you know, I, I was a fatherless child, but now I have a father. You know, we all have our testimony. We all have our story of what we now have in God that we once did not have. Hallelujah. Psalm 69. If you have ever nearly drowned, anybody ever nearly drowned? What's that experience like? <laughs> yeah, not good at all. So I, as a child, I remember there was a time that I nearly drowned. I don't remember that well. But I think it was in California. A huge wave and I got tossed in it. And, you know, you're just scary. So some of us are drowning, maybe not underwater, but we're drowning in other things. In life, we can get in over our heads in debt, get in over our heads in health issues, where it seems we have no way out and panic sets in. But God, but God, but God, God often allows us to go into these places because he's waiting for us to cry out to him. Because when we cry out to him, when we get to desperation, as we said earlier, that's when we really get to know God. That's when we really seek after God with all of our heart. 
So if you humble yourself and stop blaming others, repenting of your own wrong, and choose to follow the way of the Lord in all areas, you will not be overwhelmed. No matter how deep of trouble you are in, God will rescue you and turn your life around. So that might be you tonight. So if you're in that situation where you're drowning in over your head, put the next sentence in, but God. So I will now humble myself in the sight of God. I will turn from my wicked ways. I will repent and turn to God and he will rescue me and turn my life around. Isn't it awesome to know God's, the way he's turned our life around? Where would we be today if he had not turned our life around? Would we even be alive How deep of darkness would we have fallen into? Hallelujah. That's why the power of the testimony. People can argue all they want with me about whatever religion, about what they can prove what's wrong in the Bible and all that. But all I have to do is say, hey, have you experienced this? This is who I once was and this is who I now am. My life has been turned around. So you can argue all you want, but I am a living proof of the power of God. Enough said. Let's argue no more because you could, do you have that testimony? And usually they don't. They just have some head knowledge. They watch the History Channel. They've got some stuff. And, yep, that's it. All right, last Psalm, Psalms 70, verse 1 says, Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Jehovah. Let them be put to shame and confounded that seek after my soul. Let them be turned backward and brought to dishonor that delight in my hurt. Let them be turned back by reason of their shame that say, aha, aha. Let all those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee. And let such as love thy salvation say continually, let God be magnified. But I am poor and needy. Make haste unto me, O God, thou art my help and my deliverer, O Jehovah, make no tearing. So the people of the world are searching for excuses not to believe in God. They take delight when we, believers, are in trouble. They use it to prove their point. That that God doesn't work. See, that God's not real. Look, you're just as messed up as me. You're sick. I thought God heals. But when we cry out to God in the midst of that for help, God uses our trouble to prove how real and great he is. So sometimes it's as if the situation just continues to big, get bigger, right? The trouble. It's like, why God? Why can't you just take care of it right away? But sometimes that's not enough. People love to have all kinds of excuses. But when things get to a point where there's no other way that man cannot come up with any kind of way that, that this situation, that it had to be God. So God often does that. He gets things in a situation where it had to be God. And we like, man, but I had to go through all that yes in order to reach that person. Because my love for that person is so big that I know it was hard for what I had to take you through. But because I desire not one would perish, he will allow us to go through things so that we can testify that he is truly real. So that people have no excuse. They might still reject him, but at least they have no excuse. So let us remind ourselves that when things do look bad, like back in the 80s, for those who used to watch TV, it's only a test It's a Holy Ghost setup. For as God rescues us from impossible situations, the world will look at awe, being without excuse, as we testify of his great power. All right. We're going to finish with with some songs to worship. Remember that song that we went over about seeking the Lord with all of our hearts? Let's have that desire. I think how we're going to go from forward of kind of this change that I brought where we're a little bit more interactive. How we're going to do it so it's smooth and is I like you guys to read, if you're really interested, this next week, Psalms 71 through 80. And as you're reading, if you have a testimony that goes along with one of those Psalms, let me know and you'll just come up and share that testimony. Amen. Mm -hmm.
next week, okay? Got it? So read Psalm 71 through 80. If you've got a testimony that goes with one of those psalms, let me know and I'll have you share that testimony next week. Let's worship.